Would you? Yeah, it should chase me. Okay. Now, because uh, you've practiced this, haven't of you? Of course, I, yeah. I know what position. It's, it's big yeah. skeptics. It's not um, the Skeptics Society of Victoria. Is That's it? right. It's the Australian Skeptics Victorian Branch Inc. Okay. And they do the um, what? The convener or the? I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord of Earthly Brutality. <laughs> okay. Welcome everybody. This is the Lord of Earthly Brutality, also as um, I guess convener of the Victorian branch of Skeptics. Uh, so, and what Chris is going to be talking about today is quantum logic and rise of the mean. So, put your hands together. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay. So, uh, is there anyone here who's studied quantum mechanics before? Okay, all right. This is going to be a problem. I was hoping someone would put their hand up, and um, and and then I, no, and then I get them to answer the questions at the end. But uh, anyway, so so just don't ask any questions no, about. It. We'll be, we'll be... The popular media talk, okay. No, nothing beyond that. We've all done all the cat jokes already. <laughs> it's a little bit limited. Okay, so we're we're really not talking about quantum mechanics as such. We're talking more about logic. Um, I'm not going to get into physical quantum experiments, but well, may, there might be one in that bag there if we get bored. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the distinction between what we call classical versus quantum logic. So that yeah, kind of logic you grew up with at school um, is the classical variety. So we we're used to, you know, seeing things like this, A or B or C. Um, that upside down, that V shape is called a vel, I think, in Latin. If you're ever trying to find the right name for it. It's sort of like a vel is in between the mountains. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to remember it. So it, it generally means all. Um, now, if, if you've got that condition and you say not A then, and you say not B. Now the only way to reconcile those three statements is you, therefore to say C because we have something in classical logic known as the law of excluded middle in De Morgan's law which means if you know if it's got to be A, a or one or the other and it's not that one then it has to be the other one which you think is fairly intuitive and you've probably, uh, you know, you've probably never given it a lot of thought, but it's only when we hit quantum mechanics where things behave slightly differently. So in quantum mechanics, you, you can have uh, similar statements as these, well, but the thing is, you, you know, we can say A or B or C, and we can simultaneously say not A and not B and not C. And there's no contradiction when we're dealing with quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to hopefully explain now without getting into too much maths. Um, when we talk, so when we talk about physical systems, um, we represent this in physics, it, the state of the system is represented with a phase space or a, also known as a configuration space. So normally if you've got a single particle in a space, it's got a momentum and both the particle and the momentum have three dimensions. So it, it's, you know, in this coordinate position here and it's kind of moving in that direction. It's four, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, that means for every particle in that system you need, you need six dimensions of your configuration or phase space to describe it. There's some in the middle. Uh, so rather than, rather than give you a, a system with three particles and to put a graph up with 18 dimensions um, we'll, we'll do something really simple. We'll just talk about coin tosses 
And we'll I was just wondering how long has it been at 18 dimensions? Is that a recent one or has it been going? Well, every time you add another particle, that just adds another six dimensions in, oh, okay. in classical cool. physics. So, so this, isn't this isn't dimensions of like, we're not talking like string theory here where we describe manifolds that explain how, you know, you know how, how uh, the underlying structure of reality. We're not talking about s s temporal and spatial dimensions. We're talking about uh, ways of describing a system, degrees of freedom. So it's more a convent, think of it more in conceptual terms. So for example, if you're thinking about um, colours, you could draw up a three-dimensional space to describe them, red, green and blue. But if you were thinking about tastes, you might want to draw up a four or fi oh, five-dimensional space now to describe all the, the possible tastes you'd have, or seven dimensions to describe any arbitrary smell and so on. So it, it's, it's, this is what a, con it's called a configuration space. So it means in that space, a point describes a state of that system. I think that's what I mean. That actually came out really well. Normally I, go, I choke on my words when I say stuff like that. So, Okay, so let's get this back to a really simple system. We won't talk about particles. We'll talk about a really simple classical physics experiment that just involves flipping two coins. And we'll use um, American numismatic yeah. nomenclature because that gives us pennies and quarters and that's P and Q and that's very easy for, you know, writing logical expressions. It looks, it looks better than... I don't know, five cents and 20 cents. I don't, F's and, you don't want a graph full of F's and T's in the next slide, do you, really? Um, so there's, think of this as a configuration space. There's only four possible states the system can be in. You know, have had, uh, each coin can either be heads up or tails up. So there's four spaces, four, four states. And each of those states is represented by a subset of that graph. So each corner is a, a subset. So that we, we can use, when we talk classical logic, it's equivalent to classical set theory. So if we think about all the possible conditions, if we've got and if, if we've got the situation, we've got P and Q facing up. That implies that P is facing up, Q is facing up. And it also implies that P or Q is facing up. So this forms a, a, a partially ordered set of all those possibilities. Now, that, that's only describing one quarter of that graph. If we want to describe the rest of it, it looks, we get this beautiful structure called a, an algebra, um, which I, I think is called a B16 algebra. So these are, these are binary or Boolean conditions and that there's six, and uh, the possibilities there, it, it's a graph of um, implications. So at the top, where, where we were pointing to before, uh, oh, well, let's start from there. So P and Q, that implies both P and Q. And then it also implies all these other conditions that it's connected to. Um, all the way... So every, every state, every possible combination applies like that. Um, we've got at the bottom the empty set that is... would in logical terms would be a contradiction. And at the top we've got R2, which is the set of all possible um, sets, um, which is would be a tautology. So a condition where everything's, you know, a statement where that's always true. All the other statements in between are true some of the time. Okay, so that, 
so that's only, uh, as I said, there's only two variables in that system and it, it creates that fairly intricate lattice. And you've, you've got, now when we come to uh, a quantum system, um, we don't, before I said that every state of that system was represented by a subset. In quantum, the formalization we use with quantum mechanics it was developed by uh, Hilbert, I think, and von Neumann. And that, oh sorry, it was developed by von Neumann who used Hilbert spaces, which were a pre-existing mathematical thing. Prior to von Neumann, there was a guy called uh, uh, Hans Reichenbach, who was a very popular science writer in the 60s, who had pos in the back in the 1920s had postulated a three-valued logic of true, false, and undetermined as a logic of quantum, uh, as a as a logic to describe quantum mechanics. But there were some problems with that. But um, von Neumann, the guy who also came up with the mathematical formalism for a computer, um, was there to save the day and came up with the kind of formalism that led to this. Now, as I said before, we, when we're looking at classical systems, the state of the system is described um, as a point in a, um, a configuration space and uh, collections of states can be described by a, a subset or a region in that space. Whereas here it's a bit different. The, the state of the system is described by a subspace within the space. And in mathematics a subspace means um, so, for example, we're in a, if we're in a three-dimensional space now, any two-dimensional plane is a subspace, or any one-dimensional line is a subspace, or any point is a subspace of that. And the points are subspaces of lines, and lines are subspaces of planes, and you know, volumes are subspaces of um, things in the fourth dimension, and so on. But so we've just gone from, we can still build up a logic from that, but it's no longer based on set theory. It's based on, um, it, it's a logic that's based on those uh, relationships between spaces and subspaces. So we've got a, a null space, a, a so in this example, the whole system, let's call it R3, like a three-dimensional a three space, we've got some planes in that space. Um, some of those planes cross over each other at right angles. Um, oh, sorry, I, I was going to say, you, you've also got negation as well. So in this case, the negation in, a, in, in uh, classical set theory, the uh, opposite of a, a set is everything that isn't in that set. So it's like you think a complement in terms of a Venn diagram or something. In this case, the opposite of what's in a, a set is an orthogonal um, subspace. So orthogonal here would mean you've got a, so you've got a plane, um, a line that went through that plane at right angles would be orthogonal. So in the in this symbol here we've got some little right angle symbols that represents orthogonality and we, it, it's the equivalent of a uh, a complementary operator or a neg negation sign in this kind of quantum space. But everybody up on the orthogonal? Okay. So, so orthogonal? Yeah, it's a, a, you, 
do it when you fly with telescopes, you know, you see how command the system so Yeah. You gotta be straight. Yeah. In three dimensions, basically. Yep. Yeah, that's the way of describing it, yeah. yeah so it's not only, oh, oh. only being straight with your set square, you're going down the other way, so you've got all three dimensions, you're trying mm. to be precise and straight in mm. three dimensions. Yeah. But notice with this lattice that emerges, um, this is the G12 lattice. It's only it's only got 12 points, but we had, we've got even more, we've got a lot more variables. We've got five variables in this system, whereas in the other one we only had two variables and we had 12, we had 16 nodes. This time we've got five variables, we've only got 12 nodes. So there's a lot less connectivity. There's a lot less logical implications between statements in this logic, right? So before, remember before I said that you don't have things like De Morgan's law, law of excluded middle? It means this, the sparsity of this lattice reflects that. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to get to, I'll just run through a bit of a summary of this. Now I got this, I stole all those pictures from a book called The Structure and Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics by R.I.G. Hughes. It's probably the clearest book I've read on the topic, but I, I'd still struggle to... <laughs> I'm, I'm glad no one knows this stuff, or I'd, I'm, I'd struggle to answer a fairly, uh, you know, a knowledgeable question, put it that way. Um, or a trolling question, they're, they're the worst. A knowledgeable trolling oh, question. Yeah, yeah, they're the worst kind of answer. Okay, so what I said first off, this thing, the state space you deal with in classical mechanics, it's got, you know, six dimensions per particle. Um, whereas in quantum mechanics, it's, it's based on this idea of a, a Hilbert space, which can potentially have infinite dimensions. Um, it's a nice even number. Um, it's also a non... Uh, but uh, so a pure state of the system in classical mechanics is a point in the phase space, whereas in quantum mechanics, a pure state of the system is a vector in that space. So a, if you've got a, a vector in mathematical, in physical terms, I guess a, a vector when you're doing that sort of physics it, a vector is like an arrow with a point on the, <laughs> the end. If you've got a, a, a three-dimensional space a vector would have three coordinates you know so that if we were talking about a, a, a colour space there'd be a coordinate for red, green and blue for example. That, that you could describe that as being a vector in a, in a, in a colour space. Uh, so the idea is this in quantum mechanics, the state of the system is represented at any time by a, a vector, which is only of um, one unit length, but it can potentially have infinite dimensions. So a lot of it could be like a very, very low frequency thing, and it just points kind of more firmly, slightly in that direction, and then most of the other direct, you know, infinitus off to some infinitesimal amounts. Um, it's, and it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, I've looked at the maths and it, yeah, I, I'm happy to, happy to read it. I've never, I don't normally do the exercises at the end of the chapter. Uh, so an experimental question um, in classical me mechanics is represented by a subset of a phase space. So that it's like those, you know, the state of the coin P was a subset. It, it was, you know, half the space. If you're asked, you know, you could think about this like rolling roulette and you could think about the subsets as being the blacks, you know, is it going to come out on the, 
the black numbers or the red numbers or the odd numbers or the even numbers, they're all subsets of the whole 36, 36 possibilities. Um, whereas, as I said, in quantum, in a quantum system, it, an experimental question is represented by a subspace of the state space. Um, oops. And yeah, okay, I, w I won't go delve into the other things there because it just starts to get complicated. Uh, okay, so when does a vector space representation help our understanding of other areas of science? I, I've got power now. So many misunderstandings of scientific ideas come from applying the incorrect uh, conceptual or logical framework. Um, now this one, this is an example that uh, was mentioned in one of Daniel Dennett's books. It's from a, a philosophy article in 1975 called in Infinity and Vagueness. Which, I, I, I don't know, wouldn't you always, I'd, I'd aspire to write a 2,000 page tome called Infinity and Vagueness, that would be, that could be my life achievement, I reckon. It would be fun. They'd probably let you get away with titles like that back in the 70s. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. And the graphic art that on those books that always look like my mum's kitchen, that was fantastic. Uh, Okay, so the argument goes like this. Every mammal has a mammal for a mother. If there have been any mammals at all, there have only been a finite number of mammals. But if there has been even one mammal, then by condition one, there have been an infinity of mammals, which contradicts condition two. Okay, so some, someone seriously wrote this in a philosophical treatise. Now, you obviously think, yeah, but hang on, that's not how biology works. No, 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 it's, you try, it all sounds like an Aristotelian syllogism, right? All, you know, all, all philosophers are mortal and all, you know, it, it, but I think it's, it, it's using the logic of that kind of, that classical logic and to describing concepts that don't behave in in those ways. Um, now you could well say, oh well, maybe we need fuzzy logic to describe mammals rather than uh, well I, I mean uh, you know yeah yeah like slimy <laughs> uh, and slimy logic to describe amphibians for that matter <laughs> but uh, Hold with me, this, this gets interesting. Okay. Um, so, so the argument is there can't be any mammals as it's a contradiction in terms. So, so clearly, I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of interesting this guy's made this argument because it, it, it does make it clear that biological concepts don't follow classical logic. And when we're using terms in, you know, the terms that we use to describe um, biological organisms are, you know, behaving in a subtly different way and we shouldn't expect them to be, you know, classical Aristotelian terms. Okay, so here's a second one, Sim similar kind of thing. Mark Johnson's an Australian philosophy, um, uh, Australian philosopher, and uh, I know this one's a little, bear with me, this one's a little bit more wordy, it's not particularly wordy in a good way, um, I think he throws in a few philosophical terms that we might not all be acquainted with, but, but let's see how we go. So we say when it, when it comes to migration out, the dominant species concepts in biology have the following consequence 
all species cease to exist when speciation events occur. As when, for example, a population becomes reproductively isolated due to one or another factor. So if a population of humans becomes reproductively isolated from the rest, interbreeds and finds a new niche, then two new species come into being. Um, there's a nice philosophical word. Um, one comprising the population that recently became reproductively isolated, the other comprising the remaining population, and the species Homo sapiens ceases to exist. Um, that, I mean, I, I don't know, that, that wasn't the last, that didn't happen the last time I visited an island, surely, but. Um, the, the former extant members of Homo sapiens will then count as members of one or another new species. All that is a matter of um, extrinsic circumstance. It could happen while we're sitting on the couch. Um, does it then follow that you can migrate out of a species like Homo sapiens so that we have here another indication that the species are not substance kinds? Okay, so I think, I think this is a Aristotelian philosophy bit. Uh, it does, you've missed the scary part. You've probably come in at a good time. Uh, and uh, it does follow if you cease to be a member of a species that has ceased to exist, which is the assumption most often made in the biological literature or species, on species. Uh, I'm not sure if the literature really makes that assumption. So are you giving this as an example of flawed logic? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. No, no. <laughs> I'm not, you, yeah, you can, you can uh, troll him on Twitter tomorrow if you want. Okay, as it happens, I know of several people in the old neighbourhood of South Melbourne who still regard themselves as members of the South Melbourne football team. I deeply admire their loyalty, but I think they are confused. <laughs> what could their present membership in the South Melbourne football club consist in? You don't retain your membership in a club once it ceases to exist. And likewise, it is natural to suppose you don't retain your membership in a species you were born into when it ceases to exist and you go on. So, the thing to conclude is that there can be cases of migrating out of species Homo sapiens. Can I say implying with these I yeah. Um, notice... <laughs> that's a finish. Notice that even... If you do retain membership in the species you're born into, even when the species ceases to exist, species membership is still not an essential feature of the membership of the species. <laughs> Consider an infant Homo sapien born right before a speciation event. The infant is a Homo sapiens, but surely that infant could have been born somewhat later, say after the speciation event in which case she would not be a homo sapiens. <laughs> so, the, the, cru the crucial thing in there, there's a thing known as a biological species definition, which is very, it, it doesn't behave like this kind of set theoretical concepts. Like in the middle of there, that mention of South Melbourne Football Club, membership, you can describe membership of South Melbourne Football Club using a Boolean classical logic, right? You could imagine writing a database where you do queries of people, are they a member of South Melbourne Football Club? Yes or no, you know, one or zero. We don't, when we're talking about a biological species, if we're trying to impose those kind of set theoretical ideas onto it, we get into a lot of trouble. And I mean, hopefully this writer said this out of irony to 
make us think about the trouble we get into rather than seriously believe it. Well, I, I read it. I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm quoting him verbatim. I wouldn't have said that myself. Um, <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a... Oh, God, now what have I done? <laughs> Did that just... Ah, oh, there we are. I need a beer for my anxiety. <laughs> okay, that, so here, here's a nice biological example of what's called a cline. Um, Laris gulls are a type of bird that lives in the Arctic, and there's, I think there's seven distinct, yeah? Well, I've, I'm talking about the limits of classical logic and classical, you know, implying, applying set bound, classical set boundaries to describe biology. Okay. So, okay. we might, what were the options we had? <laughs> Ready? Okay. Okay. Systems go. okay, so the take home message from these two absurd examples is that biology doesn't fit neatly um, into set theory when it comes to species definitions. Uh, so here's an example on the screen of populations of laris gulls and they form what's called a cline. There's seven distinct species according to botanists and species one, uh, I, won't, I won't go through the, all their uh, Latin names, but species one will happily breed with species two, which in turn happily breeds with species three and one, and so on, all the way around to species six, which breeds with species five and seven. But when it comes to species seven, they are um, significantly divergent in their um, mating habits to the uh, Laris argentatus argentatus. And, uh, uh, and ridiculously, species seven is called the, the Laris argentatus argenteus. And I mean, maybe they're confused by the nomenclature and they just don't want to have a bar of it. I, I, I can only guess. Uh, but so obviously, the, they've, when you've got a population like that, they've diverged to the point where the outliers in that population no longer regard each end as being part of the same species. Um, with, you know, and you, you can't really describe that situation using classical set theory. Okay, so... Uh, so the same one flying between 1 and 7, is it? Sorry? Uh, there's no direct flight between 1 and 7, is there? Uh, there's no arrow there because they don't, they're not, they're not having sex. They, they might visit each other, but you know, they just don't want to, you know, one's in Western Europe and one's in the United Kingdom and they're just, it's, it's a, it's a, a goal Brexit or something, I, I don't know. <laughs> so they're, 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 they're breeding more with the other side of the Atlantic. I mean, that's, you know, that's what Boris is doing with trade deals already. So, uh, okay, so that, That uh, brings us to um, okay. So let's look at you know if human diversity can't be really represented in classical set theory, how does it look in a vector space? Um, there's a great study from 2009 called The Genetic Structure and History of Africans and African Americans by Tishkoff and Reed and some other fairly clever uh, biologists and bioinformaticians. Uh, they examined 
1,300 genetic markers in a population of nearly 4,000 individuals, including over 2,000 Africans. So they've pretty much, you know, taken a, a sample of human genetic diversity from all around the globe. I think, I think there were Aborigines and people from the Solomon Islands in that mix as well. Um, there were South Americans and, and uh, you know, Europeans, obviously, and Asians. So that's an awful amount of data. There's, you know, you'd be looking at about 4 million data points and, and they've put together this graph to describe, you know, fluctuations in, you know, human variants in that population. And uh, like I say, it's a, it's a very big, big matrix to look at and doesn't make a lot of, uh, you, you, don't, you don't see any trends leaping out of that just by staring at it, so to speak. Okay, so they've, because the kind of data we've got here, it, it's, um, it's the kind of data that lends itself to a vector space representation. Obviously, there's, you know, thousands of dimensions in this kind of vector space, which is a little bit hard to grapple with. So there's a handy technique that's used in mathematics called uh, principal component analysis, um, which involves, you know, kind of throwing away, looking in that big um, vector space for the... Uh, the um, factors that make the most difference between the populations and, you know, throwing away the bits that are relatively similar and just emphasising the dimensions in there where the, that maximise the difference. So if you use the PCA technique and get that data down to just three dimensions, you get a very nice plot like this one that represents <coughs> the genetic diversity in that human population. Uh, so traditionally, you know, we, we probably looked at, you know, different people and considered them to have come from different races and, and thought of race in terms of, you know, some kind of distinct human subsets of people. Um, this graph shows that, that representing, you know, that human diversity in a vector space shows you that there's more of a continuum here. Um, you know, on the one end you've got Native Americans all the way through to Eurasians, Europe, um, North Africans and Sub-Saharan Africans. And, you know, there's a, there's a few little populations that are off to one side, like the Oceanians, you know, people, people from the Solomon Island are perhaps genetically more distinct from um, and more isolated, but, but there's not a huge difference in that sense. Um, I'll show you a second graph that just shows the African populations because they're all kind of clustered and hidden over there. Because that, as it turns out, most of the genetic, genetic diversity in humans is found in Africa. You can see their Cape mixed ancestry and they're the people who were, um, I think under apartheid, they used to be called the coloreds. I think there was the ethnic, they were like hunter-gatherer people in South Africa who were like, um, the kind of like the, um, the, the sand people. Yeah, the lo there, there were a local group who were similar to sand people there. And they, after the, um, Europeans arrive, they bred with that population and there was no longer a distinct um, kind of sand population. But the, the, so the people there have mixed heritage of, you know, the white and sand population. So, but interestingly, they still stand out as a fairly distinct part of human genetic diversity in this graph. Um, so, let, okay, let's take everyone else away apart from the Africans and that gives you a bit of an idea what the grand zero in human diversity looks like. So there's 
and again, there was the, the Cape mixed ancestry people are close to the the Khoisan people. They're the Namibian uh, folk. Um, pygmies are another Afric. There's pockets of around the tropics, I think, of pygmy people. Groups like is it the Sioux population? It might be. Forget their names. Well, the uh, classical pygmies are in Congo. And yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying there's other people in the population? There's some in Rwanda, there's might be 2%. Oh, okay. they're, they're scattered across a few countries, yeah. Certainly Congo, Rwanda. Um, and then there's another group called the Hadza, who I'd never heard of before this, who were, a, um, who were perhaps a, another similar hunter-gatherer population who, I think they might be in Zanzibar or not Zanzibar, but what? It's called Zambia now, is it? I've got a feeling it's somewhere in East Africa, but it's a very small population. But it, it's it's an island. Yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't be the Very island. Mercury's yeah. Probably. Yes. 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 I think I think they're from somewhere in East Africa, from memory. Um, but it's curious because they've got the most genetic diversity of all, and they're this tiny population. So it's 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 almost like. You know, as everyone kind of left Africa, it was a small group that left and there was a larger scattered population of people that stuck around in Africa. Although over time the numbers have greatly increased, but you've still got these initial populations where the bulk of human diversity is. Same as looking at the English accent, you know, it's fairly stable across Australia. It's very hard to hear regional varieties, but if you drive a hundred miles in the UK, you, you can you can notice a lot of difference in how people pronounce things. It's sort of accents must be one of the great mysteries. You know, for example, Australians watching American TV shows so they, they develop an American accent. Yeah, yeah. Why are accents so distinctive? Yeah, that's a that's a funny one. But, um, okay, so these are hads of people. Um, I don't know how it's pronounced, I've only ever read it. Um, but yeah, and just to compare that diagram, here, here's one from 100 years ago that describes human diversity. And it, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not trying to, you know, I think at the time it was probably being, um, it, it, it uses the term human, the distribution of the human race, so it, it's not being, um, it's not going out of its way to, uh, you know, stigmatize and, and denigrate any part of it. But there's this basic assumption that humans fall into five racial categories, and they're all given specific color names, and some of it doesn't quite make a lot of sense. Like the, 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 there's blacks, reds, whites, yellows, and and browns, and uh, the Indians are called reds, but there's no Indians in India. It's uh, <laughs> it's it, it's a very it's a very uh, curious uh, situation, and uh, yeah, I think uh, so. It's interesting to see how far we've come. Okay, so. Okay, the talk was called Quantum Logic and the Rise of the Memes, so uh, I guess you're probably wondering where are the memes? Uh, sorry? We just might understand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay, so Richard Dawkins coined the term meme to refer to a discrete unit of social information in the selfish gene in 1976. Who's read it? Okay, oh, it's a so some, who's, someone's seen him talk about it on Q&A maybe or something. Okay. Um, so can we use this reconceptualization to build a vector representation of culture or semantics? So can we do what we just saw in that previous diagram with genetics? Does that work with culture as well? And what good would that do for us? Well, most of my talk involves just 
sifting through a lot of literature that people have already written and avoiding doing any research of my own. Um, so I, look, I did look around to see what kind of databases of, um, you know, you know, cultural tropes and so forth there are. I found some interesting ones. There's the eth ethnographic, and th these are probably about the big three or four major ones that, that are used by ethnographers, anthropologists, archaeologists. Uh, so there's the ethnographic atlas, there's the human relations uh, something file, um, and there's D place, which is a composite, I think, of those two systems. Now, most of these ones are all, um, they're not public databases. You have to subscribe to them. Or there's, and I'm, I'm not sure how EA is, if, whether EA is currently online or you just have to trawl through a lot of journal articles to get your head around what's into it. So I haven't really pursued them very far. There seems to be a lot more information on... Oh, hello there. Hello. <laughs> There's a lot more information on the World Values Survey, um, which has been going since the 1960s or 70s, I think. Um, and there's been about seven different revisions of that study. Um, it, it's a survey that's sent out to people around the world, and, you know, different study, different researchers in different countries carried out. There's something like about 60 questions in it that relate to people's social values, uh, how they feel about, you know, how, you know, helping people, where they see their role in society, do they see themselves as, um, you know, they, do they value their individuality or their place in the group, their responsibilities to their parents, how do they value their relationship with God, how do they feel about other people's beliefs in God that are different to their, all, uh, so that there's a variety of axes in that data set that would come down to things like, your sense of duty or your sense of joy, um, a sense of um, secularism, um, sense of, or was the other one, I think, survival versus freedom. Um, that there's, there's, so it, it, it covers beliefs in a, a large Globalism number of ways. Versus nationalism. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, exactly. That's another one that's covered by it. And uh, so the one that comes up a lot, the factor that comes up a lot in most of the studies that you read is that, um, so there's the survival versus self-expression values um, versus the uh, traditional versus secular rational values. And this graph seems to be the one, most popular one used from that data set because it uh, it highlights more local differences and they I, I suspect they all they all fit nicely into a uh, you know it's very easy to delineate the world's population if you gerrymander them into a lot of strangely shaped territories and you include Philippines in South America and um, yeah, so on. <laughs> so it's it's kind of it it's kind of you know th this is certainly when I've been reading this literature th these two axes are the ones that get the most attention. So question is is this the kind of data we could use to build a a, a meme vector space with? Hello. No. <laughs> They're nailing the doors now. It's um. more fun. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. We're gonna check it out. Um, God. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not exactly sure what I was saying at that point, but oh, I, I might have a video which. Uh, probably won't work at. Does it work at the moment? 
nah, who cares? Okay, the, there's a video that shows the shift of these values over time. Uh, basically, in the last 40 years, everyone's, most places have shifted up into that corner there, except for some in the gray area that have just, you know, some societies have collapsed a bit and shifted more in survival mode and religious mode. So it, you, you, I'm not sure if it's really that information's really telling us anything about you know what people think locally because within those populations um, that there's a, a much broader trend. It's not really mapping. It's not really mapping people's cultural values so much. A lot of those values are more dependent on um, socio-economic economic factors like. For example, here there's a very strong correlation with the amount of education people have in different countries versus their belief in religion. So you probably, and here's a second graph that uh, briefly what it represents. Each country in there has got about five data points on it and it, it shows the, splits them up by age. So there's the over 65s and there's the 18 to 24s. Now in most of the societies under 24s are more into self-expression and secularism um, and that seems to be moving in that way for most places. You know a lot of, <coughs> you know even even Pakistan the younger populations less religious. Um, so the, you, you're seeing that there's more trends that are in common with generationally than there are than regionally in terms of a lot of these cultural factors. Uh, so if we we're looking to build a, a vector space of memes, this might not be the right data set. And I don't have a definitive answer as to what is. But there's another thing we can play with. Um, we can look at semantics. Um, there's a great field called natural language processing, which involves computa you know, using computational methods to um, understand or study human languages. Understand. Well, okay, now you're going to get philosophical with me. Well, I mean, you can, you, Alexis, uh, Alexa understands you as long, much as you know, some of the people that have put you on hold on occasions, right? I'm, u using, the, I'm using the term in a pragmatic way. Uh, okay, so these two authors, oh sorry, single author, it's getting late in the night. This guy from, this clever guy from Google um, looked into this issue back in 2013. Now, it the theory behind this goes back to some French scholar in the 50s. I can't recall his name now, but what what the idea is, if you instead of you know traditionally a lot of I've, I've studied AI and machine le le learning and stuff for 25 or 30 years, and originally there used to be all these rule-based systems where you know people would try to devise kind of sets of rules that computers could determine and understand language or or under you know understand like human activity activities. sorry so like the classic example you just put in a bunch of axioms and yeah sooner or later you're gonna if you reach it up you're gonna have a machine which understands everything yeah. yeah so that was traditionally the approach and you know the attempts to do things with neural networks and stuff were were popular at first in the 50s and early 60s but that kind of research didn't quite get anywhere we didn't quite have the computational power to to push it forwards but you know what things have gone a bit crazy in the last 20 25 years and we can start doing some serious stuff with um, mathematics with big vector spaces with some serious data crunching and what, what I'm talking about here is a, an example where we've taken a data set of, of um, you know, human language and you can mince it through an algorithm and then you can get semantic information from that. You know, a vec you, you can do vector operations on, 
on words that um, put, you know, ha having those words in a vector space that shows them organized in a sem semantic way. Okay, so that sounds, sounds a little bit vague and um, uh, preposterous, so I'll, I'll go through the specifics. So an example might be to start with the English Wikipedia. There's about six billion uh, gigabytes of words in there if you download all the articles. Um, just six something like it, yeah, well, it, it's not huge, not not the pictures, yeah, yeah. Um, now, okay, so there's a there might be about three or four million unique words in there. You could probably filter out some of the weird ones like you know Chinese loan words and stuff. Um, you know, th there will be Unicode characters with Chinese glyphs and things. You, you probably don't want to be dealing with those when you're doing this kind of data crunching. And you can put them into a really big spreadsheet. So start at the, start at the word A and keep going to Zwitterion. And if you've every instance of a word in this side in the row co-occurring with a word in the column, you increment the number. Okay, so it's a, it's a fairly big matrix. It's about 3 million rows by 3 million columns, right? And it, looking at that by itself, it doesn't, you know, it, it, there's a lot of zeros in there because there aren't that many articles about aardvarks and zucchinis. Um, so it's, it's a very sparse matrix. Now, again, I mentioned a technique earlier called principal component analysis. Uh, there's another one. There, there are some similar techniques for compressing vector spaces down so that the um, vectors with a lot of, that retain their neighbor, let's say, imagine every word is in the, a big vector space where every word is represented by a vector and it's got millions of dimensions and it's very sparse. You want to crunch it down so you turn it into a much smaller um, vector space with a more manageable number of dimensions. But the trick is to do it in a way, I think it's called T-SNI is the algorithm, uh, T-S-N-I. Trick is to crunch it down in a way that preserves the proximity of those vectors. Now, I can't. I don't really have a good picture of that in my head when I'm talking about it. But um, yeah, so suffice to say, 300 dimensions seems to be about the magic number. If you do more than 300, you don't get significantly improved results. But less than 300 dimensions and it becomes, it's hard to position all the vectors in ways that maintain their proximity. Okay. All right, so we've all got that done now? <laughs> Can I move on to the next slide? It's homework after this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, if you think this, I've actually got this on my computer, I can show you at the end of the talk. And I can show you some quantum physics. Okay, so now you've got all those words embedded in a uh, semantic vector space, you can do vector um, mathematics on them. You can add vectors together, you can subtract them, and you will get meaningful words. So there's, there's a vector in there for king and man and woman and queen. So you can do king minus man plus woman and the solution will point to somewhere here. And trust me, well, I can, you don't have to trust me, I'll show you later. The closest word embedding in that space is for the word woman. This is really weird because this has all been done computationally. There's no human input in that whole process. It's all just blind algorithms that could work on any data set. And the, it's the English language, we've got tenses. Um, so the same thing will happen if you do walking minus swimming plus swam, 
the result will point to a space in the vector space where the closest word is walked. And it's not bad at geography. You can get results like you can do a similar um, calculation with all of these words and I'll show you at the end of the talk. It doesn't work with Australia and Canberra. Canberra is just a Canberra is just an, uh, yeah, an empty set or something in the vector space, I don't know. Hmm. Okay, so this kind of, um, so what can we do with that? We can use it for sentiment analysis. We could use it for deciphering lost languages. The idea is if if you've got enough text in some undeciphered language and you can make out what symbols would comprise a word, you could create a vector space and see if there's any useful information in the relations between those symbols um, that, that might lead to those kinds of hypotheses that we saw earlier. Um, and at the moment, there are some... I did see a... Um, some researchers doing using neural networks to decipher linear B recently, which is, has already been deciphered, but I think it was done as a proof of concept to see how this kind of approach would work. So um, keep your eyes open. There'll be, there'll be something about that on Science Direct in the next few months, I reckon. Um, okay, so you can also do opposite. So you, there's a complementary op operator in a vector space. So you can, um, you can, so you, you can multiply a vector by minus one and find out what the opposite is. Um, now, when I first did this, someone had done it and found out that the plantar fascia, I think it's a bone, is it a ligament or something in the knee? It was, seemed to be the term in Wikipedia that was the least related to Hitler of all possible terms. Um, I'll show you that one again now, but it, the, maybe the data set I'm using, I couldn't get the same results. You know, every time they, they dump the data, these things would, must shuffle around a bit. So it's, it's not going to preserve those opposite relationships. And black and white and things like that, they don't show up as opposites. Um, now what's interesting, Anne Preller, a, um, a French a linguist or computational scientist has analysed these word embedding techniques that are used in word to vec or other systems algorithms like a glove and found that they obey the same laws as quantum logic. So in a, in a quantum logic space, we, we talked about Hilbert spaces, they're often, you know, they can potentially be infinitely have infinite numbers of dimensions, the dimensions are complex. Um, these are only 300 dimensional spaces, they've only got real numbers, but the same, it behaves in the same way, which I, I think is, is quite interesting. Okay, so if anyone wants to read any of this stuff, or, or at least feel reassured that I have actually <laughs> done, some, done some research before I talked about it, here's, here's uh, some further information. Okay, we'd better, um, let me see. So, what have we got here? Here's a bit of code. I, I, I managed to download a, um, a file, it's called wiki.en.vec. Someone's done all the work for me. It's all, you know, Three million words from Wikipedia that have all been um, put into a vector space. So we've, I've loaded it in, took, took a while. I did this while we we're having our dinner. Okay, so let's first off, let's just check the length of that. Um, um, this is not going to be a lot of fun, is it? Uh, Oh, tell me it was loaded before, please. <laughs> okay, this is not going to be loaded. This probably won't work at all. I thought I'd 
was that? No. Ah, I've lost everything. Okay. All right. I can. Look, I'll start running this again. I'll show you. I'll show you something different, and come back to that if anyone's here in ten minutes. Um, okay. So that just takes a while to load it, unfortunately. Um, I know. I thought. I thought I'd better bring something along that was a little bit quantum physical. Uh, though you could probably get by with explaining this with, um, with you know, uh, classical electrical or classical field theory, to be honest. Um, has anyone seen these before? Uh, these are these are polarizers. So yeah. we're all used to. You know, we know the idea of particles, photons of particles with these LED lights. There's the electricity running around the circuit that electrons hit, you know, something in there and it makes a photon bounce off and, you know, eventually it, it's going to hit this screen. So here's one of these polarizers. We can, we can hold two up. To, oh, what do you know? That, okay, so they've gone fairly dark that way but if you turn them around this way if you line them up in the same direction there you know you can barely notice the two of them now anyone want to hold one um, okay so it, it gets interesting when you you put a third one in between okay so let's make them dark again I think I need to get well these are starting to age a bit you can see the film deteriorating yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, you hold. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, you hold this. Great. All right. So there. So it's all looking pretty dark in the middle. Yeah. So, okay. So whatever it is, it's blocking all the photons going in there. But what happens if we turn this middle one? Okay. So now we can see through it. It's. It's um. We can only see through it. If we turn it 90 degrees, it's still black. But if we turn it 45 degrees, we're getting about a quarter of the original light through. Okay. And if you take it away, the middle one away, it's black. It's black again. again. Yep. So there's more going through with it there. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. Wow. All right. Okay, so there's photons that get less blocked when there's more barriers. <laughs> Okay, let's go, what if I told you that whether the photon got through was determined by a probability wave? And the probability between, the prob, well you've got a maths degree, the probability of, okay, there's a, there's a constant in there, like they're slightly dim anyway, okay, but if they were perfectly constructed and you held two up the same way, 100% of the light would get through. Okay, if you turn 190 degrees, none of the light gets through. There's a probability function that determines this. And do we know a function that gives you uh, 1 at 0 and, uh, and 0 at 90 degrees? Cosine? Okay, okay. <laughs> so it's a, it works like a, okay, there's a cosine in there, right? Oh, right? But when we turn it around another 90 degrees, or another 180 degrees, once it's around a 270, it doesn't let a negative amount of light through. So the function's actually cosine squared. Are you saying it only works at 90 degrees? Like, is there any difference? No, it's, it works the same at 270. So a cosine curve will go like this, but this is a cosine squared, so that it never goes under, it kind of goes bump, 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 like that. It never goes under zero. But when you get it, now what's happening, so when you're at 90, the angles are at 90 degrees, the probability of any, part of any photon getting through is zero. 
But if you put another one in, another one in between at 45 degrees, the probability of it getting through the first two is 1 over a square root. And then getting through the other one, 1 over, and or 1 over, yeah, something like that. So you do it twice. So 1 over a square root squared, for because it's cosine squared, multiplied by, and then it has the chances of getting in between the second two is also 1 over a square, 1 over 2. So it works out a quarter of the light gets through. Each photon has a 25% chance of getting through when you've got those two set up and the one at 45 in the middle. So, okay, we, we just saw a probability wave. Okay. And, sorry? Yeah, all right. Well, I'll, I'll show you this thing in, in five. Is, I'm waiting for that, that asterisk to disappear and the number six should show up. Um, yeah, well, I think most quantum, lots of quantum experiments, like you, you can find examples of electrons behaving, you know, doing wave-like behavior. So the two-slit experiment in physics is quite a, there's another one. You can actually do the two-slit experiment again with photons. If you use a laser and um, something with small enough slits, you can demonstrate it in. I, I just I thought I thought two little things was enough tonight, but I should have I should have brought that along too because while I'm waiting for this to load. <laughs> I got a. Oh no, that's the one above. That's. Oh sorry. So that. That's just sorry. defining a function. That's really fast. For some reason, oh, loading sorry. loading a four gigabyte file and finding a, a creating a mapping takes ages. Um, so, are there any other questions about the talk that might help? And you, you're welcome to leave if you know this, you want to see buildings lit up instead of how uh, word to vec works. Um, any questions? I'm feeling awkward. <laughs> well, I mean, like, that was a cool experiment. I mean, a nice practical experiment. Mm. Um, is there any others like that that you could do, set up, like, bouncing lasers off each other that would kind of be visually interesting? Um, well, we saw, a, we saw someone, Dr. Had, Hannah Middleton, demonstrate how the LIGO detectors work. She did that first Monday night by bouncing lasers and in creating interference patterns between the lasers. That was a fairly nifty little demonstration. Mm. Um, so is, this, is this like um, measuring gravitation mm. waves, right? Yeah. yeah, so she had her own little desktop sized gravitational wave detector that <laughs> you could tap it and thump it and you'd see a change in the interference yeah. patterns on the, on the screen from the lasers as, as there were vibrations. I reckon, I mean, you might maybe in the loud, I don't, yeah, sound. yeah, I reckon those low vibrations would make the whole thing shake and would probably work better than, you know, our, yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yes, yeah. Um, you know they're building like a, another sort of tech where satellites are bouncing lasers off each other to detect subtler and subtler Well, haven't you got anything better to do with your night? <laughs> I don't know what I've, I've been, or something. Oh, it happened. It happened. Whoa. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Okay, that's a good sign. We've got the length of that 
um, word to that vector space. We've got, oh, the vocab, we've got two and a half million words in there. That's good. Um, how many dimensions does the vector space have? 300, very good, good number. Um, okay, so what does an individual vector look like? So the word singularity, mm -hmm. it's, as you'd expect, there's an array with, it's a vector, it, it's got made up of 300 different numbers. They're all kind of floating point. It's not normalized, it, it's not a, like a Hilbert space. The num, if you figured out the distance of that from the origin, it would be much bigger than one. Um, Okay, let's find some analogies. And this is the interact, once, we'll get through these five and, okay. Uh, first one takes a while and then it seems a bit faster. So when you put the three, oh, it's, sorry. It tells you what it, it tells you what it does, yeah. Right. So that's the, you know, the function. Uh, so yeah, there you go. King minus man equals queen minus woman. Um, nice isn't it and, and of course Jakarta works Canberra doesn't okay now well, that probably won't have a Wikipedia page fairly soon uh, okay what's Picard you know which writer is analogous to Picasso Hey, we got any other tokens? No. Okay. That's, that's pretty good, Meg. But oh, it reckons Prost. <laughs> I, I beg to differ, vector space. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so which, which painter is analogous to Einstein as a scientist? Metzinger, a French cubist, pretty good. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, does anyone... What, what... Uh... Okay, who, who wants to try one? About half of them fail, but yeah. So we, we, need freak, we need numbers, don't feel self-conscious. Uh, how, about, how about Kurzweil's the prediction and then um, oh. I don't know, put that in as what, what, what could be an, an interesting analogy prediction how about history His like Kurzweil how do prediction K-U-R-Z yep. W E I L. And prediction. Is that enough letters? Yes. Prediction. And then type history after that. Yeah. So this is the guy that came up with the singularity, is it? Well, he, he popularized the technological singularity. Oh. Nah, didn't. It came up with a crap word. Uh, like a um, curse of future. Like you put in instead of prediction. Future. I reckon it'll do the same because he's too obscure. Yep. So you want Mickey Mouse or The Simpsons? Because of Wiley? Oh, okay. Oh, well, there you there you go. So it's it's a word that's in a you know similar kind of space. So what about like higher and lower? So like yeah. um, like an opera and TV show or something. Or the op opera and yep. Uh, got a Dameron? Got a Dameron? Isn't that this? How do you Oh, what's one I can spell? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Twilight of the Gods. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> now, what does it mean? I think we have to do underscores. Twilight of Gods. The Gods. Opera. TV, oh, yeah. 
television. Oh, I need to press run, don't I? It's basically just crunching information, though, isn't it? Oh, that no, broke. It's, it's yep. Yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah. Twilight of the Gods, what, what if I just do Twilight? Or what's another? Yeah, oh, Aida. What about something super simple like uh, America, Trump, Australia, X? Oh, yes, okay. yeah, that's good. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Do you want yeah. something, cool. you just want something popular? Yeah, yeah something no, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, nah, yeah, I don't. Okay, yeah, so no, that, that's, that's nice. good. America, Trump. Trump, Australia, what? Like, what do we think about if it's on this Charlie Trump? Mm. Like Menzies. Married to the oh, no. Okay, another one. This this do one you, broke. Do so what's? Saying that to USA, right, than okay, so <laughs> what? There's some problems in this data set. Some things. Like there must have been typos in Wikipedia set where there's not a space between the, and, and it's turned up as a single, yeah. um, you know. Uh -huh. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. USA. Yeah. USA. Yeah. No. Again. Okay. Um, what about like England Brexit and then put Australia in the <laughs> Uh, I could show. <laughs> all right, I could show you some nearest neighbours. Give me a word. Brexit. Brexit. Okay, so what what are the similes or words that are associated with that? It's not a word. Oh, it's in there. Brexit. Everyone's. <laughs> oh, Farage in, is in there. Yes. Okay, so um, any more, or should we? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll, <laughs> I'll take it. You, 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 you can take it with you. Okay, a nearest neighbour. Well, is this in, in concept space or spelling space? Concept space. This is concept space. Okay. Well, just put, the, put something simple like the. Uh, Do you know how complex the yeast genome is? So it, it, it's really quite a weird thing to be, because you've seen where this data's come from. You can look at the file. It's just. Is it, is it, how, like, is it, is it captured like recent stuff? Like well, you're putting Gabe back in the day, we're going to something different to the data now. What if you're putting in Trump yeah. gender now? What is it? Gender. Gender, so that's kind of like. But, but yeah, you so, so this, this is. This is based on Wikipedia. This is Wikipedia. So this yeah. is a. Someone did this dump in the last year. So this oh, might be yeah, February 2019. Yeah, no, that'll be non-binary stuff then, yeah. 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 Actually, the other one... Gen derp. Uh, I don't know what gen derp is. Is that a thing? We'll try later. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think there was a way to get I'm the... I'm just thinking gender will be fun for the other way that we'll be doing it, like male, female. Yeah, yeah. And that thing of getting opposites, like I was saying, it doesn't... Yeah. With this data set that I've downloaded, there's a lot of kind of junk in there that wasn't filtered out. So there might be hashtags, there might be um, just weird acronyms or or um, foreign words like Chinese words and things like that that only appear on one page and it's very it's if you ask what's the opposite of X it'll just throw up a lot of those so I'll just give you an, but if that was all filtered out you would get you know a ligament in the back of your knee or something when you ask about negative no I've spelt negative wrong haven't I yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Negative. How do you spell it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Have you spelled negative right? Yeah. Okay. Is it meant to be a U? No, no, no. 
No, we keep them up there. Oh, okay. So where did, where was I getting it? Oh, hang on. No, I do this one. I have to do most similar. That It's not an argument to that function. Why not? I can do this. Oh, not me, let's save Was it most Yeah, it was, it's a function that... Oh, it was in there somewhere. Oh, hang on. There you go. There's all. There's all the opposite things to hit one. Uh, oh, okay. So that that's. So if they were filtered out, you would you would get very straight. You would, you would get a word that just had no association. Um, but it, it's kind of like the, the antip, you know, an antipodean word or something. All right. Well. I think I think we run out of things to do. We're all just of that which what what was it Wittgenstein said? Of that which we can't speak, we must pass over in silence. I think we've I think we might have hit that one. Thank you. Thanks. So last time I did this talk I didn't do the examples at the end, so people kind of just left like so <laughs> I think I think the examples were a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what can we do with the skip the word skip? Oh, that's a good question. So we're nearest neighbor or an opposite? <laughs> I did try to find relationship from skeptic to rationality. <laughs> e skeptic, skeptic, skeptical, skeptic. So You're a skeptic. Uh, the negative will just oh. be a lot of oh, chap. Okay. Yeah, I think. What is the skeptic? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's more Japanese than Chinese, I think. But <laughs> um, yeah, well, I did try. I did try some of those words. Cynic, maybe cynic's better. Because there's not lots of Wikipedia articles about the cynical movement, so there's not an e cynic group, and there's not <laughs> the same as rationality. There'd be a lot of broader words. Stoic. See there, that one's got more philosophical terms: stoicism and sophist and Epictetus, who was a cynic, I think. But it doesn't have uh, Diogenes. I would have thought that would be the... Yeah. What would it take to understand it? Underst oh, you want the word understand? Or are you asking it's a question? Yeah, yeah, just the word understanding. Okay. Not, not exciting. <laughs> uh, but, but in the... Understanding. The, understanding. Mm. Okay. Can you understand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. I, I thought Kafka's sort of, uh, yeah, I went to Prague actually and I saw where Kafka was born. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, they were very hung up. There's about four different Kafka museums there where you have, you know, you have to spend about, there was one where you spend about 40 cents to get in and there's a lot of photocopies on the wall and that's it. Can you scroll yeah. back up again? Please? Sorry? Can you scroll back up again? Yeah. Down. So you know how you've got like king and man. So you could do could you do skeptic and rationality and I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's try to relate to skeptic, like, yeah. skeptic rationality. I don't know. Um, astrology. Oh, <laughs> belief. <laughs> belief. Yeah. Yeah. Skeptic. I don't think there'll be many good ones on skeptic. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you do big, broader things like science yeah, yeah. versus astrology. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, so what, 
maybe science, yeah. astrology, versus... Astronomy and astrology. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Astronomy to astrology is. as finances to... Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what does that... <laughs> Does that do? Oh, oh, just, uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Reading. I don't. What? Uh, I don't know. It's getting late in the night. Yeah. yeah no, no, it's it's too. Like a ham. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hams. How about just like, um, well, astronomy and astrology. What about um? Well, no, no, no. Um, geology. Religion. Religion. Mm -hmm. Religion to science. Relig religion, f Bible, science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or is that the wrong order? I think I might have them in the wrong order. Science, religion, yeah, yeah. 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 I think Bible's the wrong word, so I should be um, Principia. Prin it should be a book, a scientific book, like a Prink. If I'm thinking abstract, no, it doesn't get it. It doesn't get it. it. Doesn't work all the time, but you know. So that's the thing. You've got to be skeptical. You see these presentations. I saw some <laughs> slides. Saw all these amazing things you could do. Obviously, someone spent a lot of time trying with these data sets before they find the ones that do work really well. But I, I mean, I, I did that and I made damn sure the Met Singer one worked. I thought that was cool. But and, and again, as, as you say, if someone downloaded that data set in another six months, it might not point to Met Singer. It might, you know, that, those kind of things will change a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I've had fun with this and I, I think I'll play around with it more and I'd, I'd love to, um, next time I do this talk, I, I, might, I might have some more things to show off or I, I, might, I might not do this talk, I might just show the things off instead. Yeah, that, that's what I was curious about, and I, I did I didn't find any good I didn't find a good example of it. So I found I found the the similarity with the, the biology issue, but I think a lot of people when they argue and talk about a lot of these soft sciences, they start talking in logical ways when they're using the wrong kind of logic to describe what they're talking about, and I think the a lot of the arguments the cultural wars we all get into is because we're actually imposing the wrong kind of culture on the concepts we're talking about so I think I think that's so I'm, I want to keep poking that stuff and see what I find out and hopefully someone else will do interesting research in this and I can tell you about it so I don't have to do it <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think I think that analogy with Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene. This is the book from 1976, and he, he said, "Look, you know, imagine cult, you know, human culture as being a system of you know interchangeable ideas that have that evolve, that have a life of their own. They can survive in the same ways that a gene can. You know, there were genes." that we've got that were around with lampreys or, you know, you know, the first vertebrates or before, um, that, that those genes or some of those genes will continue in various forms after humans have died out. There are units of culture, which Dawkins calls memes, which are ideas that reproduce themselves because they, people talk about them, people embrace them, people practice them. And even though their societies and cultures die out, those little units of culture seem to live for a long, long time. So like at the idea of God or, um, um, 
the idea that, you know, sticking your feet up is an obscene gesture or that the number three is an obscene gesture. I've met people that believe that, by the way. It was awkward. Um, a, a number of 13 is unlucky. Number four represents death. But, you know, all those little snippets of belief um, are, are examples of what Dawkins calls memes. And like people, a lot of people have gotten excited with this stuff over the years. They've, you know, you know, people have fallen into their camp and tried to write about it, but they haven't really found a use that makes it that idea kind of grow wings and and flow. It hasn't solved any big scientific or anthropological problems by talking in those terms. So it, it's kind of died off a bit. So I'm I'm interested in playing around in that space a bit more and, and seeing what I can find here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I might eat my dinner now. Mm. All right. Can I film that? <laughs> <laughs> do, do like one of those Andy Warhol film. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, sorry? <laughs> It could it couldn't be too much boring than the more than the talk. There we go. This is just weird. Yeah.